1 Samuel chapter 7. Our church has been through so much. It's good to have uh, some little good news like this. Amen. Yeah. Amen. It's really good. It's really good. We've been through so much, church. And I want to give you a sermon that we can keep it going. A lot of churches have mentioned that they want to go to Bethel. And Bethel has been the term that's used to be in the house of God to enjoy fellowship. I want to talk about Mizpah instead. Mizpah. Mizpah it means watchtower. It means lookout. And I want to stay in Mizpah in order to enjoy a Bethel. We must understand that in order to enjoy a Bethel, we must first go to Mizpah. And I hope that today's preaching, that it'll convict you and you can see something from the Lord. Let's look at 1 Samuel chapter 7, and then we'll read verse 1. And the men of kirjath Jerim came and fetched up the ark of the Lord and brought it into the house of Abinadab in the hill and sanctified Eliezer his son to keep the ark of the Lord. And it came to pass while the ark abode in kirjath Jerim that the time was long, for it was twenty years, and all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. And Samuel spake unto all the house of Israel, saying, If ye do return unto the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the strange gods and Ashtoreth from among you, and prepare your hearts unto the Lord, and serve him only, and he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. Then the children of Israel did put away Balaam and Ashtoreth, and serve the Lord only. And Samuel said, Gather all Israel to Mizpah, and I will pray for you unto the Lord. In this chapter, what we're going to see is going to be a little bit of a different style of expository preaching. In this style of expository preaching, I am going to be covering several places here. We're going to go all over in the verses. We're going to go through Samuel, how he relates to some of the verses here. And then we're also going to look through the people of Israel in several of the verses here. And then a surprise party we're going to be looking at at chapter 7. In order for us to stay function as a church or even as a family or even in life in general, there are three things that are very important. There must be good supervision. There must be good service. And there also must be good support. We see a role of a superior here and a servant as well as a supporter. By using these three roles, and if you practice them very well, we can enjoy a great Bethel together. But it first must come to Mizpah. There are things we need to be on the lookout a watchtower on some things. I hope that this sermon will be helpful to you and that you'd want to stay in Mizpah to, with me today. And that's the title is, I want to stay in Mizpah. Now, Father, you're going to have to fill within me the power of your Holy Spirit and uh, cleanse me of my sins and iniquities. And uh, I pray that today's preaching will be a blessing to the hearers. You encourage them, strengthen them, and uh, Lord, uh, out of my weakness, you can create strength and power. Will you please do so? In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to look at the good superior. Look at verse 1 through 3. Verses 1 through 3. Notice that Samuel, that he did not rebuke or speak out to the children of Israel. The tendency, if you're a superior, is to take action immediately, especially if you're a pastor. Whether you believe it or not, every one of you have some sort of leadership position. Whether you're a teacher, whether you're in charge of a ministry, or a parent, or whether you're in charge of a workplace situation. Whatever the case is, especially if you're uh, the man of the house, more so, you have a position of leadership. And your supervision has to be maintained in order to enjoy a Bethel in church or in your home or in your workplace. 
In verse 1 through 3, you'll notice the men of Kirjath Jerem came, fetched up the ark of the Lord, and brought it into the house of Abinadab in the hill, and sanctified Eliezer his son to keep the ark of the Lord. And it came to pass while the ark abode in Kirjath Jerem that the time was long, for it was twenty years, and all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. And Samuel spake unto all the house of Israel. Notice that Samuel was able to speak and rebuke them of their sin until after 20 years. You know, the timing with people nowadays is that we feel like that, you know, we're compromising if we don't take action right now. And that's especially tempting if you're a pastor, especially if you're a pastor and there are members who haven't spiritually grown for many years and many years. The tendency is to call it out. Uh, you know me, I don't call it out, I don't rebuke until it does something that affects the personal, uh, not the personal, the public testimony of the church. So I don't compromise on that. I don't be wishy-washy. I'm not telling you to be wishy-washy. I'm not telling you to be a negligent parent. I'm not telling you to be a negligent pastor and you tolerate every kind of sin that goes around the room. However, when there's a time that you do personal speaking out and a personal rebuke, it has to be done at the right timing. That's important. It has to be done in the right timing. The problem with people today is they don't do things in the right timing. The problem with people is because they're thinking about themselves, I have to take action now, take action now. And that's not good leadership. You have to find the right timing. I'm not telling you to wait 20 years and then by that time your child grew up, grew up and became spoiled, right? For example. But you have to look that at every person is different in every scenario. Can I repeat that again? Every person is different and every scenario is different. How you raise a child is different with how you raise a church member. And how you raise a church member is different from how you raise a child. And when you're a husband, you have to lead your wife. And that's especially difficult as well for you men. So you have to realize that there's a right timing. A right timing. You'll notice that verse 1 and 2, there's that softness part that Samuel saw, so then he aimed for it. See, you have to make sure that as a leader, you catch that right timing and you do it. The problem with leaders is we're too busy or we're too prone to doing our thing or we have a defeatist attitude that the person's not going to listen to me. And because of that, that's why when there's always a good timing for you to call it out and to rebuke and to help out the person, you lose that chance. Then you're not a good supervisor. You must have good supervision. Do you want to stay in Mizpah? Do you want to have a good, successful home? Do you want to have a good, successful church? You need to keep that supervision open. As a Bible-believing pastor, it can be very difficult for me, especially now that I have an online presence, but I never lose that supervision. There's a person that I'm praying for years and years and years, and I have to keep my eye on the person. There's a person who's faster in the growth, and I have to keep my eye on the person person who I feel like will never grow. I have to keep my eye on the person. I cannot lose track. Otherwise, you cannot have a good Bethel today. There must be a good supervision. Everybody is different. And if you look at my list, it's crazy. It'll give you a headache. It'll give you a headache every time I write on the list. My tendency is to cross off a list, but I cannot do that. I have to find the right timing in God's way. And you'll notice that it's so important to pray, that's why, at verse 5. You notice that in order to be a good supervisor, the tendency nowadays is we want to do something ourselves first rather than pray. Did you pray? Well, I tried everything and it didn't work. No, you didn't pray. That's what didn't work. That's your problem. If you go by your own flesh, it will fail. Look at verse 5. It says, And Samuel said, Gather all Israel to Mizpah, and I will pray for you unto the Lord. Notice right here that Samuel, he prayed. He didn't let down his supervision. He prayed for the people. It is so important that you can't give up on the child. You can't give up on the church member. You can't give up on your wife. If you have some kind of position to lead you or to supervise you must not give up praying 
Otherwise, before you tell me, Pastor, I tried everything, the person doesn't listen to me, then I'm going to ask you, did you pray? You know, whenever I ask a fellow pastor for advice, sometimes I get scared when they ask me, did you pray about that? Yeah, yeah. So I pray before I ask for help quite often. And if some of you have done, uh, done the habit of that, you notice most of the time it does work. Most of the time it does work. And if it doesn't work, then the Lord will resort you to other options. But the problem is you don't pray first. And I found out that in this area, and especially in online presence, I mean, it's so crazy on the tasks that I've been given at a young age, I was able to survive. Why? Not because of talent or skill. It's because of my inabilities with my youth and with the areas here. And then an online present is so difficult. Odds would be impossible, but if I can do it, you can do it. Amen. You might say, how so? Because I prayed. Yeah. And most of the time that worked. You know, you got to look at verse 8 through 10. Notice that Samuel, he prayed and helped people's problems through the Lord. He didn't put his own self-effort. He did it God's way, not his way. Verse 8, And the children of Israel said to Samuel, Cease not to cry unto the Lord our God for us, that he will save us out of the hand of the Philistines. And Samuel took a book on parents' counseling, on family counseling, on how to, uh, on how to build a big church. And uh, from Rick Warren's book on how to build a bigger church, from Paul Chapel, how to plant a bigger ministry. No, Samuel took a suckling, a sucking lamb and offered it for a burnt offering holy unto the Lord. And Samuel cried unto the Lord for Israel. And the Lord heard him. And as Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to battle against Israel. But the Lord, see that? Not his skill. The Lord thundered with the great thunder on that day upon the Philistines and discomfited them. And they were smitten before Israel. You know, when you do it God's way, you can lead. Can I repeat that again? If you do it God's way, you will lead successfully. The temptation is to watch Oprah Winfrey and then give, have her give you good advice because she apparently does have a PhD on something, I guess. You know, there's a reason why she's popular, right, I guess. And then just listen to her advice and etc. To listen to Dr. Phil, to uh, go through uh, psychotherapy tri treatments and then learn all these tips and all these skills and then you can resolve and solve people's problems. No, you've been, they've been doing that for over a hundred years. There's still problems. Divorce is sky high. Families are broken. Crime has gone sky high. I don't think anything works. They use that treatment on criminals and a lot of times they don't work either. So what is it then? You got to go through the Lord. You got to go through the Lord. What, 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 it, what is the special thing? Do you read your Bible? Do you pray? Do you go to church? Do you write down notes on something that the Lord showed you in the teaching and preaching? Did you write down something that the Lord showed you in his word? Did you pray at all and ask the Lord, give me wisdom? Did you do it God's way? It's easy to compromise to get more numbers into church and to get a person saved and to get a person to become a Christian. But that's why 90% of churches are so worldly and messed up. And people, a lot of people flock to church, but a lot of people get out of church too at the same time because they did it their way, not God's way. They listened to Rick Warren, Joel Osteen. They did not listen to God's own word. Got to do it God's way. Then you'll lead right. Well, it's impossible. Uh, it's going to just push that person away more. Well, let God handle that. Maybe the Lord wants that person to be pushed away more so that God can deal with them. You know, your problem is the Bible says right here at verse 10, the Lord thundered. Not you, the Lord. The Lord has to take that person aside and the Lord has to convict his or her heart. The Lord has to put that person through some kind of experience. The Lord has to be the one to soften and melt the person's conscience. Do you have that power? You have no power over that. Leave it alone. Let God handle the person. The more you put your hands onto it, the more stress you get. 
If you've done everything you could to raise a child, everything you can to raise a successful home, everything you can to raise a successful church or workplace situation, then leave it to the Lord and let God work finally. He can't work when you keep interfering with his work. When you do the work, when God's molding and moving the person, you're like, no, 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 not that way. I got to do it this way. And God's like, fine. Every time I do something, you seem to ruin it, child. You pray and help other people's problems through the Lord. You look at verse 12, verse 12. Then Samuel took a stone and set it between Mizpah and Shen and called the name of it Ebenezer, saying, Hitherto hath the Lord helped us. Notice right here that Samuel raised up a stone so that the people can see that, remember, God helped us that day. You know why your supervising, your supervision is so poor? You don't remind them. You don't show them. You don't motivate them on the great things God has done. That's your problem. You know, the thing is, is that in churches, they think it's a routine when you're parenting, it's a routine. Leading in a workplace scenario, it's a routine. No, it's not a routine. You got to put motivation in there. And that's why the liberals use the motivating route. But they do it through humanistic effort, not God. And there's a lot of motivation with the Lord. You think that the, I mean, look at the, uh, look at the kids when we sing hymns. Look at the people when we sing hymns. Look at the people when they come down on the altar and get right with the Lord. The people when you hear their testimonies and you thought that, wow, I never knew that you had a testimony like that before. You know, the thing is, we have to create this motivating environment on the things of God and remind the people, see, this is what re real, what's real. Why do we take people to summer camp to show them what's real? Why do we have a blowout here to show them what's real? You know, you need to set up a stone, remind them of God's goodness. If you show them candies and vacation trips and birthday gifts or anything that pleases the flesh, you're only motivating them with the fleshly thing. And you're not motivating them with God's stuff. You got to show them the great things of God. And then when you do that, the person's eyes get open and they go, wow, that's what's worth living, not out there. You know why your supervising is bad? Your supervising is bad because you don't keep track on showing them the good things of God here and there. Have you ever noticed that every time the person probably was in trouble and you reminded that person, let's pray about it, and how God moved, moved and answered the prayer, do you always remind that person, see what God did? And then you notice that person's heart softens up a bit more to the things of God? I don't know if that happened to you before. I know that I do that when I, I have to do that in this church. I have to remind that. I'm married, so I have to remind my wife. I have to remind my family. I constantly do that. Why? So that they can be more softened to the things of God. And it's not of me, it's God. I don't force the person, it's God. I show them, see what works? See, I told you that this and this would happen if you let the Lord move. You got to remind the person of God's goodness, motivate them about God's goodness. But you lost track of that because you're too busy. You're too caught up with your routine. And then you failed in your leadership. Well, you know, this person that I'm trying to uh, supervise and lead has a problem with patience. Did you remind them of God's goodness and patience? Well, this person that I'm trying to supervise and lead is having a trouble with anger. Did you remind them of God's goodness and blessing on what happens when you have self-control? Well, this person has a problem with fear and worry. Well, did you remind them about God's goodness of how he said, peace be still? You failed your duty on that one, and because of that, you can't enjoy Bethel at church or at home. Verse 13, verse 13. Notice that good supervision also is protecting the sheep from enemies. So the Philistines were subdued and they came no more into the coast of Israel and the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. Why don't you have worldly music here, worldly dressing, stuff like that? No, I ain't gonna allow that. I protect the sheep. Why do you call out the preacher's name? You shouldn't do that. I protect the sheep. You know why? If I just address a wrong doctrine, 
Some people don't get that, and then they watch so-and-so out there on some video clip or attend that person's church, and they go, wow, what a great guy, what a great teacher. No, it's more clear if I call out the person's name. When I do that, then the person can know. It's easier to do that way. Why? Because I protect the sheep from enemies. Why do I have to raise up my child? And, you know, you got to be careful with the worldly friends you hang around with. And you can't have this. You can't play with that. And you can't listen to that. Why do I have to do that? You know why? Because you have to protect your little lamb from the enemies. Expose them to violence and sexual imagery all day long. Don't, don't say, what happened to my little boy, my little girl later on? Don't say that. You got to protect the sheep from enemies. Why? Because that's good supervision. Yes. You know why you don't protect them? You know why you let them have what they want? Because you're lazy. Yes. That's why. You're lazy. You don't want to go through the drama. You don't want to use extra patience, extra love, but sternness at the same time because it's so hard to do that, that balancing. It's so hard. It's easier to just yell it out or to let them go. You know what that is? That's either what they, uh, even psychologists mention, that's, um, I think they called it aggressive parenting or negligent parenting. And those two are bad. Yeah. No. You know why? You're lazy. That's why. Let's be honest. You're just lazy. That's why you don't protect the sheep from enemies. You know what Joel Osteen is? He's a lazy man. Yeah. You know why? Get that fame, popularity, increase of church by not protecting the sheep and addressing wrong doctrines. Just shake the Pope's hand and everything will be fine, Mr. Osteen. That's laziness. It's laziness. You need to protect the sheep from enemies. Why don't your church grow, Pastor? Simple. Because I kick out the wolves. And because of that, sometimes sheep mis misunderstand and leave. Why? Because I have to do my job. Supervising. That's what you need to do. You want a good Bethel? You want a good Bethel? Look how much you tolerated those enemies to come in and your house is a wreck right now. And your church is a wreck right now. Look at verse 15. Verse 15. And Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life. Notice right here that good supervising is to make sure that you are faithful to do it all the way to life and keep up with everybody. Now, I know I'm a pastor, and uh, I, can't, I don't keep up with everybody as much as I want to, but you know what? I try to. I try to. I always give the offer open. I always give the offer open, and it's so difficult to balance it out with my family where taking care of this sheep, I won't neglect the things in the home. It's so difficult, but I try. I try. And the thing is, is that that's what you need to do. You need to try to keep up with everybody. Sometimes a person will say, thank you, pastor, for keeping track with me on that one. Yeah, that's encouraging to me. You know why? I can't remember 20 different people. I got enough in my brain. It's, my brain cells are fried and losing stuff. All right? My wife has to keep reminding me something. That's how bad it is. But it's so important because I cannot fail my duty in supervising the sheep. It's my job to faithfully keep up with you. People who need counseling and help to make time and opportunity to do so. Amen. And to do it what? Till the day I die. Yeah. I don't have a retirement plan. There are preachers who retire. Hey, you know, that's between them and the Lord. And I think it could uh, sometimes maybe it is God's will. All right. They have good reasons to retire. But me, I'm not retiring by God's grace, yeah. by God's grace. Maybe I might later on, but by God's grace, I won't. Hopefully I won't. And I... The reason why is I must be faithful all the days of my life to visit and keep up with people. That's what parenting is. That's what leading is. That's what supervising is. That's what pastoring is. You do it for life. Oh, you know, so much work. Oh, when is this going to end? No, you go on till the day you die. Yes, yes. That's good, supervising. I want to stay in Mizpah. Mizpah, where leaders can lead their homes leaders can lead the church leaders can lead their group successfully and people can depend and feel confident and trust their guidance and their leadership and it can flourish the second thing is good service good service look at verse two through six do you lead well do you supervise well a second thing is do you serve well do you serve well 
Verse 2, notice right here, And it came to pass while the ark abode in kirjath Jerim that the time was long, for it was twenty years, and all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. Look at verse 6. And they gathered together to Mizpah and drew water and poured it out before the Lord and fasted on that day and said there, No, you know, if you were there for me that time and that place, I could have done better. No. Oh, well, I was busy that day, so you would understand. No. We have sinned against the Lord. You know what good service is? You just say, you just have a softened heart to listen. Every time you just want to talk. You just want to give out an opinion in your mind and heart and disagree, disagree. That's not a good servant. A good servant, good service is you listen. Yes, sir. And you receive judgment. Well, who that person think he is? And then you try to find that person's weakness to judge. Yeah. No, you receive judgment. Yes. Yeah. Yes. You get judged. And then you know what you need to do? You need to confess it and say, you're right. I've done wrong. Amen. Amen. I've done wrong. That's what you need to do. You need to have a good servant's heart. Even leaders need to have a good servant's heart. You might say what? A pastor is a minister. You know what minister means? Serving people. You know what I do? I, keep, I don't lose that leadership aura and authority, but I do keep my ears open. I do listen. If there's something I'm wrong, even if it's my wife that I lead, I'll say, okay, you're right, I'm wrong. That's what I will say. You know why? Because I cannot have a good Bethel until I stay in Mizpah. Until I go to Mizpah and be on the watchtower and the lookout. That's what Mizpah means. And check myself and serve the other person. Then I can enjoy a Bethel. You know why you're enjoying a good Bethel here and there in this church? Someone's being a good Mizpah. Someone is serving. Look at verse 4. You know what a good servant would do? Get rid of anything that interferes with his service. Did you hear what I said? Get rid of anything that interferes with his or her service. Look at verse 4. Then the children of Israel did put away Balaam and Ashtaroth and serve the Lord only. You know why they were able to serve the Lord alone? They put away Baal and Ashtaroth. You know why you can't come to church as much? Something's interfering. There's your Balaam. That's your Ashtaroth. And you need to get rid of that so that you can be a good servant. Now me, I'm not trying to force people to attend every meeting we have in our church, do things for our church, or to increase the ties. I don't believe in doing that kind of stuff, but I do believe this, that our human nature and our tendency is that we could do more for the Lord, but we just refuse to surrender something that keeps interfering with our time with God. You want to be a good servant? There's something that's interfering. Is it your job? Is it something in your family? Is it some kind of worldly thing that you're attached to? Is it making more money? Is it school? What is it? You need to cast it out. Maybe it's your sin as well that you're struggling with. Whatever it is, you need to get rid of that thing. Amen. Otherwise, you'll never serve the Lord. You'll never serve the people. What if I had those kind of excuses? I'm too busy. I'm too sick. I'm too frail. I'm too inept. I'm not talented. You won't see me here then Sunday at all. How can we have a church if there is a person that says, I can't do it when anything interferes in life? You know what you need to learn? You need to learn how to manage and overcome the interferences. You need to, why? You need to cast away Balaam and Ashtaroth. That's your job, to be a good service. Verse 6, the Bible says, And they gathered together to Mizpah and drew water and poured it out before the Lord, and fasted on that day and said there, we have sinned against the Lord. Now notice right here that Samuel said, gather all Israel to Mizpah and I'll pray for you. That's what he said. If you come to Mizpah, I'll pray for you. But the people, when they came at verse 6, they didn't just gather. They gathered and what? Drew water and poured it out before the Lord and fasted and confessed. You know what a good servant is? He's not just doing what's required of him. A good servant will do extra. Hey, let's gather to church together. And then you go, okay. Sunday main service, I've done my job. Let's go home. That's not a good servant. You know what a good servant is? Okay, let's all come to church together. All right, I gathered to church and 
I'm going to sign up the volunteer sheet in the kitchen and let me help out clean up the room a bit. I'm going to stay a little extra longer so that I can find something to help out the church and the pastor. That's a good servant, is to do extra spiritual things, not just what's asked or required. Are you doing a good service? I want to stay in Mizpah. I want to stay in Mizpah. I want to have a good service so that we can enjoy a great church. Think about it. If your family, everyone did their extra part, not what, just what was asked or required. Do you think you'll have a happy home after that? I think so, right? If everyone just didn't do what they made a deal on or compromised with, they did more than that. They went the extra mile. Then you can have a good Bethel. But it comes with Mizpah first. Look at verse 8. Verse 8. A good service would be in verse 8. And the children of Israel said to Samuel, Cease not to cry unto the Lord our God for us, that he will save us out of the hand of the Philistines. You know how you can do more service for the Lord? Is that if you were to cry out and ask for help in distress. What? Really? Really, pastor? I thought that, you know, I'm supposed to help out, shut my mouth. And, no, that's your, that's your problem. Your problem is, is that if you got something painful or a burden that you're carrying, and then it turns out that you never, uh, let's say there's a leader in charge, and you never let that leader know the pain that you are carrying, then you know what's going to happen? No one knows the pain you're going through, and they might take advantage of you without knowing it, and then here you are trying, I'm trying to be a good servant, trying to be a good servant, just shutting my mouth and trying to help out and doing extra, but they don't acknowledge the good thing that I did and what's their problem and fault? No, 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 that's not their fault, that's your fault. That's good, brother. Amen. You know why? You never asked out for help. Amen. The Lord never asked you to do something more than you can't bear. Well, it seems like it when I'm serving the Lord, it's too much that I can't bear. Did you ask him for help? Did you cry out to him about your distress? See, you did it. That's your problem. That's your problem. Hey, pastor, I need help. Okay, um, I can't talk to you right now, but we'll schedule this day and time, okay? And then I'll help you there. Don't show up. You know why? People reject the help that they could get so that they could serve even better. How can you have energy and strength to serve if there's bitterness, weariness, and misery? How many times do I have to tell people who are first new into our church, and I would say, if you have any concern or question, don't hesitate to ask me. Why? It's my job. If there's a misunderstanding or something that you think is wrong or something, it's my job to help you open your eyes through the Scripture, make you see. But it'll be unhealthy if you carry it all the way down to the grave, then you'll carry that bitterness against the preacher to the grave, just like others who left this church, and carry that bitterness with them, and they will carry it to the grave. Well, the pastor said this, said it this way, and talked that way, and hey, you're one to talk if you didn't ask for help to begin with. Yeah, Verse 11 and 14, a good servant will fight and try to rescue people's souls. Look at verse 11. And the men of Israel went out of Mizpah and pursued the Philistines and smote them until they came to beth -car. And verse 14. And the cities which the Philistines had taken from Israel were restored to Israel from Ekron even unto Gath. And the coast thereof did Israel deliver out of the hands of the Philistines. And there was peace between Israel and the Amorites. Notice right here that the Jews, they were good servants. They did a good service to Samuel, helped out their leader because they fought at verse 11. They pursued hard against their enemies. And then if you look at verse 14, they were able to deliver, they were able to save a couple cities. That's what a good service will do. You know how you, you can contribute a good service to the ch church? You keep fighting and you keep going out and try to get souls saved. Amen. That's what you can do. That's how you can be a good servant. It's hard. It's hard. But that's what a good servant is, is that they pursue. They fight. You're not a good servant if you come in always defeated. 
asking someone else to fight your battles. You fight for them. You fight for your family. You fight for your church. You fight for your loved one, someone you care about. You fight for souls. That's a good servant. A bad servant is always asking someone else to do the battles for them. Always depending on that person to fight. Not saving a soul, but just sitting down and hoping to hear the soul count list go up because you did nothing. That's horrible service. A good service is if you went out and you fought, you know what made this church a mispah even more and more? Some, every single person or most of the people here is going through some kind of battle and they fight and they fight and then drag themselves to church and try to be a blessing to the person. That's why you can enjoy a mispah. They drag themselves to street preaching, visitation, pass out tracts themselves, to try to win souls to Jesus Christ, pray for souls to get saved. That's why we enjoy a good mispah. I don't know about you, I wanna stay in mispah. I don't wanna stay in a church. I don't wanna stay in a home where everybody's asking somebody to do something else for them. Let's look at verse one through two, one through two. My last point is good support. Good support. Now there's one group of people that has been heavily ignored here. We've seen Samuel as being a uh, supervisor, supervision. We've seen the children of Israel as, you know, doing service. But then where do we get the support part here? Kerjath Jerem at verse 1 through 2. The most ignored. And the men of Kerjath Jerem came and fetched up the ark of the Lord and brought it into the house of Abinadab in the hill and sanctified Eliezer his son to keep the ark of the Lord. And it came to pass while the ark abode in Kerjath Jerem that the time was long, for it was twenty years, and all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. Notice right here that Kerjath Jerem, they were given the ark of the covenant to take care of. And the children of Israel failed Ker Kerjath Jerem. They didn't get right with the Lord. They didn't take up the Ark of the Covenant, put it at its rightful place. No, they just let it sit down for 20 years and let Kerjath Jerem do all the work for them. You'll notice right here that the leader, Samuel, did nothing for Kerjath Jerem right here for 20 years. You know what that is? That's good support. You know what good support is? It is when you keep going in supporting the people, in supporting the leader, no matter what, no matter how long the people sin, and no matter how long your leader doesn't help you. That's good support. Do you supervise well? Do you serve people well? Do you support people well? You know what a supporter is? A supporter is, is that, yeah, brother and sister in Christ keep sinning and messing up, but you don't point out their sin and their problem. And you just keep on going for the Lord and help that brother and sister out no matter what. You know what a good supporter is? You know, pastor never gave me a call. Pastor never followed up with me and didn't shake my hand and didn't help me out with this scenario. No, you just keep going and support the leader and say, I'm praying for you, pastor. Thank you for the sermon. That's what good support is. You know what that is like in the family home? Is that when everybody is not doing their role properly in the family, you keep the support going. And they might let you down, but you don't let that family down. Yes. You don't quit praying. You don't quit leading. You don't quit doing your part. You don't quit serving. That's a good supporter. Well, it's been, uh, it's been so long. How long? Oh, it's been all the years of my life. Go on. Go on. 20 years, Kerjath Jerem didn't complain. And it was much longer than that, too. They kept that ark of, the, they kept that ark of God going and going until David came in. Are you a good supporter? Look at verse 2 through 5. 2 through 5. Notice right here, And it came to pass while the, ar the ark abode in Kerjath, Jerem, that the time was long, for it was 20 years. Oh, finally they get right with God. And all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. 
Man, praise the Lord. Maybe they'll get this ark out of my hands now finally. They're finally repenting. Verse 3, And Samuel spake unto all the house of Israel, saying, If ye do return unto the Lord with all your hearts and put away the strange gods and Asherah from among you and prepare your hearts unto the Lord and serve him only and he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. Wow, about time, pastor, preach that sermon and finally get those people right. And man, we're going to get the ark of God out of here. Look at verse 5, uh, verse 4. Then the children of Israel did put away Balaam and Ashtoreth and serve the Lord only. And Samuel said, come on, help out those poor people at Kerjath Jerim and let's get the ark out of their hands. Nope. Gather all Israel to Mizpah and I will pray for you unto the Lord. Pastor, what? I thought you preached a great sermon and I thought that uh, uh, you people got right with the Lord and uh, wait, yoo-hoo, you forgot about me and... Uh, why are you going away to a summer camp and having a great time and a yoo-hoo and... No, Kerjath Jerem, they were supporters! Even when people repent and the pastors still don't help, you still support. Yeah. That's good preaching. Not only when people keep sinning, but even when they repent and they still don't help you out, you help them out. That's good support. That's good support. That's good support. Even if people repent, even if the pastor preached and addressed something, but it didn't go all the way that you wanted, you keep supporting. Yeah. No. That's a good support. Look at verse 12. Verse 12. Man, Kurgis Jerem should win some kind of global award or some kind of Nobel Prize or something, man, for what they're doing. Look at verse 12. Then Samuel took a stone. Oh, about time. He's about to award a Nobel Prize to someone now. That's great. And set it between Mizpah and Shen and called the name of it Ebenezer, saying, Hitherto hath the Lord helped us. What in the world? He puts it between Mizpah and Shen. Where's Kerjath Jerem? I don't see that anywhere. <laughs> you know what? Kerjath Jerem in the end didn't receive any praise or credit for their support. Yeah. I've done so much for the cause of Christ, pastoring a church, helping out the people, and then I don't get, don't get what? You want the praise of men more than the praise of God? You know what you do? You just uh, let other people receive the credit and praise and the thank you. And Kerjath Jerem, you just stay behind the scenes and keep up the support. It's hard when you become a small-time missionary pastor as well. And sometimes even me, when God has blessed me so much, that can pop up in my mind. You know that? But I have to learn to let go and let God and just say, Lord, you know, I just support. That's it. No credit and praise on me. I just get it from you. That's okay, Lord. You need to do that. You need to do that. That's Kerjath Jira. Look at verse 15 through 17. 15 through 17. The Bible says, And Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life. Wow, so he... This pastor took care of the church every moment of his life. At least once, this pastor will thank Kerjath Jerem, right? And he went from year to year in circuit to Bethel, not Kerjath Jerem, he went to Bethel. He keeps going to Pensacola where they have all the blowouts so that he can be a good get main speaker or something like that. He didn't visit little old me, my own church over here. And Gilgal, he went to those big places, you know, and Gilgal, and Mizpah, and Judge Israel in all those places. And his return, finally, come back to Kurdish Jerem, about time, I'm last on your list, was to Ramah. For there was his house, where he had a vacation home over there. And he sat down and relaxed, and there he judged Israel. And there he built an altar unto the Lord. You hypocrite, you pastor, you! Going out in your home and relaxing and you didn't even say a thank you. Kurjith, Jerem didn't even get a visit from their pastor. And they were content with when he just rested in his home yeah. and worshipped the Lord his own way. Amen. Amen. You know what Kurjath Jerem is? Seeing everybody enjoying a great time yeah. in church. Seeing everybody enjoying a great time in the home. And you just sit behind the scenes. Yeah. And you're the weirdo, you're the strange one, you're the oddball, you're the one that didn't receive the most credit and support, 
And you just sit behind the scenes and you're content with that, that they're all worshiping the Lord, that they're all happy. Amen. And you just sit behind the scenes and let them enjoy a good time. And you're like, I'm still here holding the ark. Yeah. And I'll keep holding it for you guys. That's Kurjath Jiram. That's Kurjath Jiram. That's good support. I don't know about you, but I want to stay in Mizpah. Think about it. If every single person had those three roles, they supervised well, everybody in their roles in leading. A lot of you people have your own leadership roles. You need to think what they are, your supervising roles. Secondly, service. Are you serving other people? Third, are you supporting? Think about what kind of a church this will become. Think about what kind of a home you will become. Wow, this is Mizpah. Yeah. Do you want that kind of a home? Do you want that kind of a church? Look what happens at verse 13. So the Philistines were subdued and they came no more into the coast of Israel. And the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. And the cities which the Philistines had taken from Israel were restored to Israel. From Ekron even unto Gath and the coast thereof did Israel deliver out of the hands of the Philistines. And there was peace between Israel and the Amorites. That is the kind of home that you want. Is that the kind of church that you want? Is that the kind of life, your own life, that you want? Then bless God, everyone should do their part in supervising well, in serving well, and supporting well. And by doing that, then you can drive out the Philistines that have invaded your life. Depression, misery, hardship, worry, fear, sin, worldliness, rebellion, disobedience, lack of peace. And you can drive all those Philistines away and finally gain the peace that you wanted. A peaceful kind of church. A peaceful kind of home. If you want that in your life. And most of all, a peaceful your life. Your life. And if you want peace in your life, you need to supervise well. You need to serve well. And you need to support well. And drive out those Philistines. Get peace in your life today. I want to stay in Mizpah. Yeah. Do you want to stay in Mizpah with me today? Or I want to stay in the world. I want to stay in sin. I want to stay in my own way. Then live like that. And when those Philistines come, let's see how your life is working. You've tried that. It don't work, right? There will always be a Philistine. There will always be no peace when you do it your way. What about now, this time? Why don't you start supervising well, supporting well, and serving well? And let's see God move. Every head bow and every eye shut. I want to stay in Mizpah. Too many broken homes. Too many broken families, too many broken churches, too many broken lives because all of us have failed to do our part. We've all failed to do our part. Acting in those three areas will become a, such a successful, blessed life. There's some Philistine that's invading your own life, your heart. And that's why you have no peace right now. If you want stability, you finally want that peace that you wanted, then stay in Mizpah. Will you come to Mizpah with me today? Mizpah means watchtower or lookout. It's time that you start watching, looking out those things that you failed. And let the Lord transform your life, your home, and your church. He can heal. He can heal it. But if you only do it God's way, only if you will finally supervise the way you're supposed to, serve the way you're supposed to, and support 
the way you're supposed to. We always want to make sure that everybody goes to heaven after they die. I want to ask you a simple question. If you were to die right now, are you 100% sure that you would go to heaven after you die? You might say, Pastor, I am not 100% sure that I'll go to heaven after I die. Well, I want you to get saved today. It's so easy, so easy to get saved. Just three steps. Step number one, you've sinned against God. Do you admit you've sinned? Well, of course, Pastor, I've sinned before. Then you have to realize because of your sin, you will burn in hell forever after you die. You might say, well, Pastor, I don't want to burn in hell forever. So then I have to clean up my sin. Is that it, preacher? I have to go to church? I have to tithe or be religious or get baptized? No, there's absolutely nothing you can do to get rid of your sins. Only God can get rid of your sins. And that's step number two. Step number two is Jesus is God. He died, buried, and resurrected. You might say, well, pastor, I know that story. I know that story. Yeah, you know the story, but you don't know the real meaning of that story. Do you know why Jesus went through that bloody mess for you? Remember, you go to hell because of what again? What's the problem? Sin, right? The only thing that can wash away your sin is the blood of Jesus. That's why Jesus died for you. Only his death, burial, and resurrection can clean up your sin. Don't you dare try to clean up your sin yourself. Don't think that you can go to heaven by going to church, getting baptized, cleaning up your act, and being a good Christian, and keeping the commandments. No, you will still go to hell. Because you can't clean the sin, only Jesus. What he did on the cross, that very act, when he shed his blood, that's the only thing that can clear your sin. So you might say, okay, I, I believe that, what do I do? Step number three is simple. Tell God you believe in that. That's it. It's that simple. Just tell God, God, I believe in that. That because of my sin, that I'll burn in hell. So as I repent, I only trust what you did on the cross to save me. And that's it. Will you be willing to do that right now? Just say it to him. 15 seconds or less, you're done. It's so simple. I'm not asking you to sign up for church membership or to give me money. This is not going to, I'm not asking a commitment out of you. All I'm asking you to do is just to say that to the Lord. 15 seconds or less, just tell him that you believe what he did on the cross to save you. You might say, well, pastor, I'm willing to say it. I don't know how to say it. Can you help me out? Sure. I can give you the words on how to say it. All you have to do is repeat after me. Remember though, repeating words in a prayer doesn't save. It's believing what he did on the cross to save you. You're putting your belief to it when you say it, all right? So believe it. You don't have to say the words out loud. You could just say the words to yourself, okay? I give you this chance to get saved. This might be your only chance to get saved. When did you ever hear preaching like this before? When did you ever hear the gospel of specific chance for you to get saved like this before? Did you ever get that in your life? What are the chances you'll get this again? Why not get it over with right now? You can repeat after me in this way and you don't have to say it out loud. Just say it this way. Dear God, I repent as a sinner I believe Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected so his blood can wash away my sin. I only trust in that to save me from hell. 
In Jesus' name, I pray, amen. Amen. If you could bow your head and close your eyes just one last time, please, just one last time. We're wrapping it up. Thank you for your patience. It's not 1.30 yet, so we still have time, but I'm going to wrap it up right now, okay? If any of you have just repeated those words after me, and this is the first time that you've done it with me, could you just slip up your hand real briefly? I'm not going to point out who you are. Every head is bowed and every eye is shut. Just slip up your hand real briefly, real quick. All right? All right, thank you for your honesty. There's no shame to get saved, people. No shame. It's a blessed opportunity. Is there anyone else? Thank you for your honesty. All right, we'll just close it with a word of prayer, all right? Father God, I want to thank you so much for salvation through your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Had it not been for salvation, we would burn in hell. I pray that you'll bless uh, the baptism that we're about to have. Make it a blessing to the people. Make them see the joy of salvation. Baptism is not salvation, Heavenly Father, but it shows to the people that the person already received Christ for salvation. So I pray that it will be a good demonstration of that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.